and a warm welcome to the program. This is Politics Today live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Wakimbale in Abuja. Let's begin tonight by telling you about uh, one of the things that INEC is doing is to engage stakeholders, and they've continued to do that over the last four or three days. And today, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubo, says the commission is embarking on a comprehensive cleanup of data of registered voters to ensure that only eligible citizens are added to the voters register for the 2023 general election. Professor Yakubu was uh, saying this while playing host to a delegation led by the president of the Nigerian Union of Journalists in Abuja. In the next 23 days, that is on the 12th of February 2022, a major end of tenure election will hold in the Federal Capital Territory to elect six area council chairmen or chairwomen and 62 councillors. This will be followed by two governorship elections in Ekiti State on 18th June 2022 and Oshun State on 16th July 2022. Party primaries for the Ekiti State governorship election are scheduled for the 4th to the 29th January 2022. For the Oshun State governorship election, Primaries will hold from 16th February to 12th March. In the case of Ekiti State, all 18 political parties have indicated their intention to participate in the election and have already served the mandatory notices for their primaries to elect their candidates as required by law. The Commission's preparation for the three off-season elections is one of the issues that we'll discuss at this meeting. In addition to the end of tenure elections, six by elections are scheduled to hold on Saturday, 26 February 2022, in Cross River, Imo, Ondo, and Plateau states. The detailed timetable is already uploaded on our website and social media platform. Hard copies are also included in your folders for this meeting. That's uh, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu. Let's tell you that the conversation we had with uh, the former governor of uh, Ekiti State, Ayadele Fayoshe, a um, few days ago on the program has since generated some reactions. This time around, coming from the woman, the go former governor spoke about who led a protest in Abuja uh, asking that uh, the process that led to the Congress was uh, not a good one. Um, Mrs. Titilayo Owolabi Akerele has condemned the, as defamatory Fire Shea's uh, description of her relationship with the former governor, Shagwoni, saying it is diversionary and a deliberate attempt to attack our personality for leading the Abuja protest against the controversial Congress. Take a listen to uh, the reaction of Honorable Titilaya Owolabi Akirele. There was no Congress. And that was all I said. And then the next thing I will see is that uh, Ayodele Fayoshe came to the studio to say that I was a close and old friend of Shegoni. So for me, I don't know how that correlates to what is on the table. I am not an, an uniformed woman. I am not a 30 or 40 year old woman who you can blackmail with, maybe because I'm having an association with a man, and that's why I should now keep quiet and stop aspiring. So I ask for a right of response to say no. The, the objective statement that I made that a Congress never had in it, it stands and it remains. And instead of you to speak to that, you are saying it's because I have association with Shadow. What, what's the correlate? So next time it comes to the national television to express my relationship with any man, you will just have to go to the law court to prove it. Honorable Titelaya 
uh, will I be accurately responding to what Governor Fauci just said? So let's get to see some of your political roundup stories, then we dive into our major conversation for tonight. In continuation of his two-day working visit to Kaduna State, the president has commissioned the modern Sabungeri market in Zaria. President Muhammad Buhari commended Governor Nasir Arufai for fulfilling his electoral promises to the people of the state. He made the remarks at the palace of the Emir of Zazao, Ambassador Nuhu Bamali, when he paid homage to him at his palace. The governor has really delivered the trust given to him by the people of Kaduna State. Governor Yusun Wiki of River State is threatening to publish names of phone numbers of all bunkering kickpins in the state. Governor Wiki stated this during a meeting with community chiefs, local government chairmen and heads of security at the government house in Port Harcourt. <laughs> Civil society groups in the Doe State have staged a peaceful rally at the King Square in Benin City against the impending hike in prices of petroleum products in Nigeria. They say it's worrisome that despite the suffering of Nigerians, the government is contemplating an increase in prices of products which are in use by the people. The civil society groups insist the government must overhaul the petroleum sector by ensuring that people don't pay more for petroleum products by refining the products in Nigeria. We know that greed works against the best interests of the collective. The Kwara State government has said that it worked on a total of 143 roads since inception of the present administration of Governor Abdurrahman Abdurrazak three years ago. Speaking with journalists during a news program called News Keg Series, organized by the Correspondence Chapel of the Kwara State NUJ in Ilori, the State Commissioner for Works and Transport, Rotimi Ilyasu, explained that the administration has also done maintenance works on over 200 roads in three senatorial districts in the state within the period. And in enhancing an effective implementation of the administration on criminal justice law in Plateau State, it has been suggested that attention should be given to strengthen the state justice reform team. Professor Yemi Akisha George, a senior advocate of Nigeria, in a keynote address at the retreat for judges of both the Superior Court and Lower Bench of Plateau State Judiciary in Jos, stresses that the justice reform team will deepen the synergy required among the various stakeholders towards effective justice delivery. The success of all the lives of any is usually decided within its first 100 days in Well, then, let's tell you that some parts of Lagos State today uh, came alive. It was a gog when chieftains, governors, leaders, and members of the People's Democratic Party across several states stormed Lagos State to receive the Lagos for Lagos group led by Chile Adediron, who declared in, in, in interest to lead the state. Governors and leaders of the party have vowed to take over Lagos from the strong grip of the ruling APC. Take a listen to uh, the coordinator of the Lagos for Lagos group, who are formerly members of the APC, who have now defected to the PDP. Our incoming governor, by special... When they said to us that Jando, you can't get it done being an opposing, in an opposing camp, I said, I have somebody who ran for an election without having government at the center and government in the state and defeated both the government at the center and the government in the state as a result of his popularity. What well, you heard, uh, uh, Jide Adedero, the coordinator of Lagos for Lagos Group, who have now moved into the PDP. Well, he was received by some of the governors and the national chairman of the PDP, Senator Yocha Ayu.
From the streets of Lagos, let's take you to the streets of Benin City, where some civil society groups in Ado State have staged a peaceful rally at the King Square in Benin City against the impending hike in the price of petroleum products in Nigeria. They say it is worrisome that despite the sufferings of Nigerians, that the government is contemplating an increase in the price of the products which are in use by the people. Take a listen to some of the leaders of the protesters. With what we know about this government, uh, we know we sleep, or we, we sleep and we wake up, something else is happening. And so anytime they are thinking of doing it, we have started our agitations now. So that even if it's February, if it's December, if it's next year, they should know that the people are suffering already. And we are tired of it. And we are not tired of hitting the streets. That's one of the messages we are sending today. They should know that we are not tired of hitting the streets. So anytime, even, when, even if they think it's not now, anytime they think they want to do it, they should already know that the people are already agitating to say, we are tired of whatever increment. We don't care how they do it. Instead, the illegal refineries that they say they have, they say Nigerians do uh, illegal refineries. I think that the government should find out how they do these things and also make it a national thing. We can refine our fuel in this country. Refine Nigerian oil in Nigeria. We've, we've, we've taken a look at the Petroleum Industry Act. It's anchored on the privatization of the industry. We know that greed works against the best interests of the collective. Actually, the mess we find ourselves in this country today is on account of the greed of a few. The Petroleum Industry Act would facilitate the domination of the Nigerian petroleum industry by a few. In fact, that's one of the reasons why they are hesitant to get the refineries working. Because what they have in mind is privatization. A few individuals who own the wealth that this country has been blessed with. That is not going to conduce to redistribution of the wealth of Nigeria. Rather, it will further polarize. The rich will be getting richer, the poor will be getting poorer. Some of the sound bites of those who took to the streets in Benin City uh, for the protests uh, on the impending price hike. Those are speculations of the possible removal of a subsidy. You're watching a live picture from Kaduna State where the people of Kaduna State and the government there are hoping to receive the President Wu is being in the state on a two-day working visit. He's supposed to be received tonight at a dinner to honor him. Any moment from now, you might be seeing more of that live pictures of the event and the proceedings from that arena live from Cardinal. So we're live for you right there on the ground. As soon as we get a sight of the president, we will cross live to the event but uh, China Television's politics today we continue on other platform aside of the SUV. Well, the protest you saw earlier was uh, came a, a day after a former military head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, warned against the possible remover of a subsidy on fuel, which he says that the effect will be more hardship on the people of Nigeria. Meanwhile, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju, has said, no matter the challenge or resource constraint that the people are facing, or the government is facing, the people need to know that their government will always be in a position to support and make provisions for them. This was a statement credited to the Vice President, Yemi Oshibajo, when he received a delegation from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. The Vice President went further to say, quote, We have challenges, post-pandemic challenges, resource constraints, but we still have to make provisions for the millions of people who expect that government must be in a position to support them in a terrible and challenging period.
So let's get down into the state of the economy. This fuel subsidy matter, what it means for the average Nigerian and uh, the effects that it could be. What government needs to do the way forward. Is government uh, in a quagmire of thought or idea to go forward from here? Let's get to it, everyone. I'm being joined from our Lagos studio, um, the CEO of Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise and Economy Business Advocacy Think Tank, and a former DG of the LCCI, Mr. Muda Yusuf. Thank you so much, Mr. Yusuf, for joining us tonight. And here in our Buja studio is the National Secretary of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, Alaji Sheu Gabam. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Alaji Gabam and Thank Mr. You. Uh, Yusuf. Let's get to it um, uh, and look at what the Vice President said vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the issue of the uh, forest subsidy matter. And I guess, let me begin with you, Mr. Mr. Yusuf. Give us a sense of what this means. Is, it, uh, is government in a fix? in terms of the situation it finds itself, um, a lot of people have said the subsidy must go. And the government is contemplating. Ministers have said it will go. Uh, the Senate president met with the president and said there is no signal that it will go. Um, yesterday, Abdul Salami Abubakar said it, that it will cause trouble. The NLC president was on the program yesterday and he said, no, they have not had an agreement with the government to remove it. How much of a fix is the government in this situation? Yeah, thank you, Shion. I think it's a fairly complex and, and complicated matter. Because just as you said, uh, the government seems to be in a quandary. There are a number of uh, dimensions to this. Uh, first of all, let me say that we are faced with a conflict conflict between economics and politics. Uh, we are essentially in the realm of what you can call political economy. Uh, from a fiscal sustainability point of view, certainly the way we are going about it, I'm not sure that it is fiscally sustainable. I'm talking about the financial capacity of government. The last report we had from the finance minister, as at November last year, we had an actual revenue of 5.5 trillion naira. We paid a debt service of 4.2 trillion naira. Personnel cost was 3.02 trillion naira. We are already talking about over 7 trillion. We haven't talked about overhead. We haven't talked about capital expenditure. That is to show you how challenging the situation is. And as oil price increases, I mean, today now, we are talking about oil price at about $88 or $89 per barrel. The higher the crude oil price, the higher the level of subsidy. So this year, we are talking about subsidy of between the range of one trillion to two trillion, by next year, if the oil price remains as high as it is, we'll be talking of a subsidy of close to three trillion. So from a financial management point of view, it's a very, very difficult situation to manage. But from a political point of view, it's equally difficult because we are having the general elections next year. And from a political strategy point of view, I don't see the government jumping into this subsidy thing at this time. But that is not to excuse the fact that we are sounding very inconsistent as far as this subsidy issue is concerned. Because I was taken aback. We already have the Petroleum Industry Act. Section 205 of that act clearly says that the petroleum industry will be governed by a market pricing framework. This act was passed by the National Assembly. It was assented to by the president. The Senate president is the chairman of, 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 of the National Assembly. There was, an there was an appropriation for subsidy, at least up till June, according to the finance minister, so that from July, hopefully, the subsidy will be, that, is, that was stated in the budget. So for the Senate president to come out and say that there has been no directive 
around issues of subject removal or not. I mean, it, it sends a very, very, very wrong signal to those who are thinking of investing in the sector. I take the point that we need to be very careful because of the social environment, because of the poverty situation. But we should not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Because we need to ensure that we have that's an a, that, economy yeah. that is sustainable. And we should look at a model. Yeah, that's exactly the point, because uh, it does look like one is not even uh, very clear on the direction the government wants to go. But I mean, it's instructive what the president, uh, vice president said today. That no matter what is happening, it, the government will provide for its own people and we cater for its own people. That shows uh, that perhaps uh, there are some signals that the government is getting some pressure from the people. Let me bring in uh, Ms. Uh, Alaji Shewu Gabam into the conversation. As a politician, Alaji Gabam, how difficult, politically speaking, is this decision to make? Um, a lot of people have criticized that, look, this subsidy is a scam. It's not the right thing. To, it's not the right way to go. Uh, but the government might be finding it difficult. If you were in the government's shoes, what would you do? If you are in opposition anyways. <laughs> Let me thank you so much for inviting me to uh, add a value to this national conversation, which is extremely very difficult. It is very difficult for anybody to see a distinct line between policy and politics because they interwoven, uh, especially when there is no priority in terms of policies and programs of government. In the absence of creating a political environment, you cannot have economic viability that will drive the country and you will suffer a lot of complications. The government have been mooting the idea of removing subsidy for a very long time. They have removed subsidy before. But I think uh, what government is all about is about policy that have human fees. You are, you, are, you, are, you are battling in a situation where people cannot afford to, to feed themselves daily because of devaluation of currency, high cost of foodstuff, uh, and because of devastation of COVID globally that are affected global economy. And what I thought is that the, the economic team of the presidency will generate a lot of factors uh, related to security of the country, what are the situations, what are the public opinions, and what is the status of, of the purchasing power of an average Nigerian. These are factors that are supposed to have guided the government in whatever decision they are supposed to take. Now, the political environment is extremely very charged right now. It's, it's being saturated with all sorts of issues, so, uh, crisis reading, and so on and so forth. So, no responsible government at this juncture will think of adding hardship to an average Nigerian. No responsible government. Mm. What the government needs to do is to find a way to alleviate the very devastating economic crisis the country is facing, the economy, I just saw the, the, the World Bank report that uh, Nigeria economy is worse in the last 10 years. And instead of thinking how to navigate through and, of course, strengthen the economic nexus of the country, uh, coming with this policy at this difficult time, election is around the corner, uh, thinking of removal for a subsidy is not going to go well fast for the country, for the government, for the government officials and the president as well. You cannot have it done. You would rather create an anarchy. Uh, if they put, take their mind back to what led to NSAS issue and the current situation of uh, shortage of food stuff virtually everywhere, uh, I'm someone who takes care of almost 20 orphans. I buy things in the market virtually every month. So I don't need anybody to tell me how things are difficult for average. So, so Alaji Gabam is. is, uh, is is a fix between what is politically expedient Absolutely. and what is economically realistic. Exactly. So in a political year as 2022, it's suicidal politically for the government to, to make that move. Absolutely. Is that the case? Absolutely suicidal because they have not prioritized their economic operations. And if you have not prioritized your economic operation as government, you will fall into such trap. And they have fallen into such trap between dealing with political exigencies and economic uh, considerations, you know, to, to see how they can stabilize the whole thing. But there's a way to navigate through. Mm. You have your Naira that is being devalued virtually every quarter, and it's affecting every cost of uh, things in the market. 
And you are not doing anything about right. it. Let me bring uh, Mr. Sean Bisuga, who has since joined us. He's a uh, public affairs analyst. Thank you so much, Mr. Bisuga, for joining us tonight. Thank you for What's your me. take on, uh, on it? How difficult is this for government? And what, what would you suggest is the way out? So, People are already on the streets. Yeah, I, I think the government's position is clear. Um, government has said, as of right now, <laughs> there is no removal of subsidy. And that is what, at least from the next meeting, um, Governor Obaseki of Edo State and Governor Abdullahi Suli of Nasarawa, they both spoke to journalists after the National Economic Council meeting that was chaired by the Vice President. And they said, as of right now, there's no decision on, on, on fraud subsidy. subsidy because of all the obvious reasons you just said, economically, it doesn't all go well, particularly because of COVID-19. A lot of people are still grappling with, you know, all, all, all what the pandemic has caused. So the government is saying, this is not the, the best of times to, to do it. But at the same time, you, know, you, you need to make some decision because what Nigerian government is saying is that, see, we have a lot of infrastructure deficits. We have a lot of economical deficits and we, we need to make sure that somehow we provide for the people and there's no way that you're going to provide a boom booming um, um, economy without infrastructure and for you to get infrastructure you need to get money and it's to get money that we have um, that I've brought about this conversation and in any case NNPC has gone from being a public venture to a private venture and at some point Every private venture has to be profit-driven. And, and I think these are some of the factors that the government is looking at. But as of right now, the government has been very, very clear that subsidy removal is just a discussion. And you know, when NEC um, had that discussion, a subcommittee was set up and Governor Nasser Arufai was to chair that committee. And what happened was that at the last NEC meeting, he, he, he gave a feedback to say, oh, this is what we found out. After meeting with relevant government agencies to say, this is our resolution. But of course, nothing has been passed. But as it is, okay, maybe uh, when we come back from the break, of course, uh, I will let our viewers to listen to what do the governors from yesterday said after the after the NEC meeting. But the question is that we do not know for sure what the government is going to do. <laughs> um, by June, it's expected that no subsidy will be captured in the budget. That's that, those are the expectations because when the PIA fully comes into into effect, I'm not sure that. Uh, Subsidy should be in, in effect. Those are the expectations. And what the Minister of Finance has said, it was shocking when we heard the Minister of, uh, of Information and the Senate President said, look, the government doesn't have any plan to remove subsidy. Yeah, well, again, you see, in, 2000, um, in 2020, nobody expected COVID to come. There were plans on, on, on the ground, but everything changed. And that, that's the point. So the, the plan is that by June, this thing will be done. But of course, the government has to look at the people and has to look at the situation on ground. As they say, is this thing realistic at this point? And, and that's why you see the government is saying, for now, we cannot remove subsidies. Should the government had come, I mean, is, is there a way the government could have done it better? So that it doesn't look like the government is not straightforward with the Nigerian people. Because we've heard it from more than one uh, uh, government authority to say, subsidy we go. And all of a sudden, the new year came and they're saying, Different thing. But I'd like you, our gentlemen, to, to, to weigh in on that. When we turn from this break, the conversation continues. It's a big political year. Elections are beckoning. And the fact remains that can the government be bold enough to make some audacious economic decision? Some say it is politically suicidal. But will the things that are right to do be done in the face of all of this? We we'll come back and discuss more. Join us again. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Let's get back to the conversation. I've been speaking with Mr. Muda Yusuf, a former DG of the LCCI, who is also now the uh, CEO of the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise and Economic Business Advocacy. He's a, uh, is a think tank. He's a former DG of the LCCI. Thank you so much, Mr. Yusuf. Uh, Mr. Sean Bisuga, an economic and public affairs analyst, and Alaji Shewu Gabam, the National Secretary of the Social Democratic Party. Thank you so my gentlemen for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Let me allow you gentlemen to listen to the two governors that spoke after the meeting of NEC yesterday on the subject matter of subsidy. Um, it's instructive. I want us to capture what the vice president said. That look, these challenges are daunting. We understand it as government. But our effort is to ensure that we cater for the people. But first and foremost, everyone, 
Take a listen to the governors of Nasarawa and Edo State. When NET looked at the, some of the, the analysis last year, we then realized that less than one third of the states of this country consume two thirds of the subsidy. So the issue of equity also came up. All of these findings were presented to NEC, and NEC has had several deliberations, and the deliberations are still on. Uh, we didn't make any presentations on this because there has not been a decision. But in reality, all of us Nigerians know that there is now the Petroleum Industry Act, and NMPC has now become you know, a limited liability company. So NMPC will run differently. So if the Ministry of Finance you know, provides for uh, six months, you probably can understand part of the reason for pro provision of six months is before NMPC fully takes off. And at that moment, that's when decisions uh, are will be made. Governors of Nasarawa and uh, Edo State speaking on the outcome of that meeting. So, I was going to say earlier, ask uh, the gentleman who are panelists on the program tonight. Um, let me go back to our, our Lagos studio with Mr. Yusuf. Could there be a way the government could have um, presented this to, to the people so it doesn't look like there is a flip -flop? There is an obvious flip flop. But the VP had said, we will cater for the people in any case. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that. There is this proposition by Labour, which anchored the whole subsidy removal narrative on the capacity to refine petroleum products domestically. And I think the thinking of government, perhaps, was that by June, July, we'll have been able to have some domestic refining capacity for petroleum products. In other words, we're expecting that by that time, uh, the Dangote refinery possibly will have come on stream. And the refineries of government that uh, the government is trying to revive will have, will have also come on stream. So if we're able to scale the domestic refining capacity, the shock of subsidy removal, or even the burden of having to subsidize the petroleum products will significantly be reduced. So that is one window through which this situation can be managed. Secondly, you see, when we put policies in place, policies are meant for people. They are meant for human beings. And when we are dealing with this kind of issue, it cannot be pure economics. It cannot be pure commercial principles. So we need to situate it within the political context and within the social context, so that as much as possible, we bring everybody on board, particularly now that many of the citizens are on edge because of the devastating effect of inflation, because of the devastating effect of the depreciation of the currency. So any little thing can lead to a major spark in the system. <clears throat> so I think it, is, it, is, it would be nice, and I think that is what the government is trying to do, to contextualize it within the political environment and within the social environment. And the governors also did say that you are going to engage with labor. And I'm sure in the process of engaging with labor, uh, they will look at different possible models of how this thing, this matter should be handled. So that is, that is my expectation from this. But building the domestic... Um, before, before I bring that same perspective back into the Abuja studio here, Mr. Yusuf, I know you usually don't discuss politics, but because you're in a political program, I will throw you into the fray. And I, I like to get your view from an economic point of view. Tonight is about political economics. So let's look at this uh, perspective. Anyone who will lead Nigeria going forward from 2023 will definitely have to have his mathematics right will have to be able to tell Nigerians not only what they want to hear, but what will work. Because a lot of the times, you hear politicians get on the podium and say, I will give you one million jobs in one hour. But when they get into government, they discover that it's not as easy as they say. 
give us an understanding of what Nigerians should be hoping to see or hear from anybody who wants to lead this country from 2023. What do you think, especially in the face of labor agitations and some of these economic, major economic decisions that should be made? You see, there is no salvation without sacrifice. If you want mm. to fix a very bad situation, some sacrifice has to be made. And we have had a lot of talk about reforms. There's a lot of reforms that needs to take place. Reform around, I mean, we are just talking about oil and gas now. The PIA was supposed to be a major instrument of reform. But with what is happening now, the confidence of investors is beginning to win. Because if they are going to be picking and choosing what part of it to implement, then we are, we are, we are doing something that will erode the confidence of investors. So there is a very important need of refining, I mean, of reforming the oil and gas sector. Because if there is any sector where we have not been able to encourage investors to go into, is the downstream oil and gas sector. And that is why that sector is in tatters. Because all the refineries, all the assets in the downstream are being managed by bureaucrats and by politicians, unlike what we have in other sectors. So when we are talking about the regulation of removal, what we are talking about is to create a policy environment that will allow the attraction of private capital and private management expertise into that sector. That is the end game. But because of all these political and social issues, it has become very difficult. So we need to deal with it at an appropriate time. We also need to deal with issues around the foreign exchange management. That, is, that has also been a major issue with many investors. We need to review what it is we are doing now and see how we can put in place a foreign exchange management framework that will inspire a lot more confidence in investors. And of course, we need to look at the cost of governance. I just read to you now, the, the, the revenue is 5.5. The debt service is 4.2 trillion. Personnel cost is 3 million. So even what we have is not enough in terms of revenue to cover the debt service and personnel costs. We haven't talked about overhead. We haven't talked about capital, capital budget. So these are fundamental things. But as a politician, you don't go to the podium and be telling people the kind of sacrifice that they will make. That should not be good marketing. It is when you get there, can I begin to you know, look at how you can get things done and get people on board, engage the strategic stakeholders, so that uh, you can put in place whatever reforms that you need to put in place. But as a politician, all right. We, we, very we are, we, we, we are, we are the gradually going to enter into the season of promises and season of campaigns and season where people make uh, plans uh, as they uh, try to woo Nigerians uh, for votes. And we hear a lot of uh, those promises, just uh, lofty and very lovely ones. But how the performance will happen, that's another issue. And so let me bring you into the conversation now. Uh, the question will be, Will it be legal for us to continue with the subsidy regime when PIA takes full effect? Uh, hopefully, when everything gets into full swing in June, that's a big question there. Or whether or not PIA is going to hang in the balance uh, as we operate uh, the four subsidy regime quickly. Let me get your intervention because I want to bring in the political dimension I threw to Mr. Yusuf to you. Well, it depends on the on the government and the actors that drive the economy because they created a very complicated situation, as everybody has uh, confirmed. And uh, in the absence of facing reality, given the reality that uh, we are facing as a nation, definitely there will be a lot of back and front. And we don't expect a back and front at this critical time that we are transiting, you know, uh, from uh, in an election area and you have economy that is very stagnant, and then you have also uh, bills that have been signed into law, which is supposed to come into effect. And once the modalities are not clear, and there's a very conflicting interest between the, 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 the economic policy, the political exigencies, you are definitely going to be in a very terrible situation. And you end up creating a very panic situation in the country that will drive away investors. Because no society on earth 
will drive investors in an atmosphere of chaos or uncertainty. But is there now, a way the government could have handled this better? Absolutely, there ah. is. There, there is. Government ought to have, have a very strong, viable economic team drivers that will provide policies and programs that are workable, that you can be very operational. The ones they have on the ground now is viable. They're like uh, I, I, Dr. Doin Salami. I, I don't know. Sh Sh Doin Salami was appointed a bit about maybe a month ago. He's the, he's the about, chairman of yes, the about, Presidential Economic yes, Advisory about, Committee. Yes, about a month ago. So but he, he's, he's the head of the Presidential Advisory Committee. Officially, the president made announcement of him heading the team about one month ago. No, he no, might, no. He's, have been been in the system. he's been there for, 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 for some years now, for about two years, when they said the likes of Professor Soludo and uh, yes. Mr. Macri one year are in that team. Exactly. But he was made the economic advisor, advisor. just a few exactly. weeks ago. Exactly. I'm talking about the economic advisor a few days ago. Now, economic and advisor that was just officially been given that title a few months ago, in an economy that has suffered devastation of COVID, instability, shortage of so many other things, I don't know what miracle they can perform within this period that we are and change the status quo. Look, let me give you the situation of both the political and economy, just like an aircraft that have loaded a lot of people that want to take off. It needs a very powerful engine for it to take off. Once the engine is weak, it's not likely for it to take off. So what you are looking for, you are looking for a futuristic, decisive policies and programs that can be able to uplift the country from where it is now, both economically and politically, for you to have a stable environment and to think of other issues. Hmm. I'll bring the political side of things to you because you will be one of those who will be lifting people's hands on the podium, your <laughs> candidate uh, in 2023. <laughs> and uh, we'll probably be hearing, we will provide 10 million jobs in one hour. But, but before I bring Mr. Bisuga, I would like to remind everyone what the former military head of state said yesterday at that event uh, where he chaired and he gave a warning. I'd like uh, to, uh, Mr. Bisuga to hear because the government has said there are palliatives when subsidy is removed. Uh, when that is done, what are the effects? Can we cushion it? The government said it's prepared to cushion it. <laughs> well, take a listen to what the former military head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, said yesterday. The result is a continued rise in the prices of food items beyond the reach of many Nigerian families. On top of all these, Your Excellencies, fuel prices are expected to rise significantly in the coming months, as announced last November by the NNPC. We all know when this happens, as the government has planned, it will push many millions deeper into poverty. General Abdul Salami and Bubaka, he will say, we'll push many more Absolutely. people into deeper hardship. Absolutely. But I, I want to hold on to the word of the Vice President. I'd like Mr. Bisuga to give us a sense of what this means. It carries a lot of weight, isn't it? But uh, how far they can go in cushioning that effect, uh, I'm looking for what the Vice President said. And if my producer can bring back uh, the quote of what the Vice President said, he said, we have challenges, post-pandemic challenges, resource constraints, but we still have to make provisions for the millions of people who expect that government must be in a position to sub support them in a terrible and challenging period. You know how much we're spending to pay back the debt, to service the debt? Another question there. We are still borrowing more. Where would this support come for, to cater for the people, as the VP said? The palliatives, the 4 million Nigerians that is going to be taking off this pain or the expected hardship from the removal of subsidy. So, Jim, before I answer you, let me, let's do a little bit of comparative politics here, okay? Um, when the Biden administration was going to come in the U.S., you had the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better bill, right? And uh, you see how long it took him to pass just one after they, they cut it. So, you see, sometimes we, we think that government doesn't have the best of brains or is not well prepared or doesn't plan well. This is not true. Government puts in the best that they can. But you see, sometimes there are situations that have to negate these things. And then it pushes back a policy of government. In and this and, case, and we see, are, what, what, we've seen it. I'm talking of the subsidy now. Yeah. So when people are saying, oh, 
government has said it's going to do this, why is it not doing it? Sometimes, you know, there are, there are things that happen and government have to review some of, some of its policies. But back to what you said, um, the um, National Economic Sustainability Plan was one of the things where, that the Vice President, you know, he chaired um, the NESP. And you can see how it cushioned the, the effect of um, COVID. As a matter of fact, renowned economist, um, Rewan Bismarck, he said, um, that the reason why Nigeria came out of recession was because of the NESP. You know, there was a survival fund, there was the free registration for companies, and there were many other things that the government did to say, see, we need to cushion the effects. The aviation sector got money from governments to, to make sure that, see, air, air prices don't go off the roof. And what the government did was hospitality across all sector, government made sure that, see, they reached out to people, they put money back in the, in the hands of people so that the effects of COVID, the effect of the poverty does not come crashing in. And that's why you, you, people must understand some of the decisions that government is, is making. The vice president has said what he said because this is, in fact, is usually referred to as the senior advocate of the masses. Most of the programs and policies that he pursues uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Nigerians who are down there, it, it, it's not about you know empowering the elites or those who already have. It's about those who do not have. It's about ensuring that you see people can go to a website, click on it, apply for themselves, and then they can receive those funds. And I think we have loads of testimonies to that effect of people who don't know people who apply for government um, um, programs, be Empower, be um, Survival Fund, be Jeep, be. Um, conditional cash transfer and and they, this thing they get it directly they, you don't need to know anybody and that's well, the, the, the question is that all of this that you've said i mean uh, 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 in the books fantastic ideas absolutely but the world bank has just said in the last 10 years the this is the worst of the economy that we've seen um secondly uh, we've seen that full prices have gone up inflation uh, has, has not been like this in the last uh, six years so the question is that whether or not these things are working, whether or not if this, uh, if the subsidy is removed, because that's the subject matter, will Nigerians suffer more than what they are suffering? Can the government, do the, does the government have the guts to take that move? So, so um, our experience like this, um, we have a global problem economically. So Nigeria is not living in a bubble. But we have an isolated situation peculiar situation and it's in the in the issue of subsidy uh, remover and yeah. whether or not we need to remove subsidy which, which i'm not true. sure it's every part of the world where they've signed pia into law yeah uh, pib into law it's not every part of the world where government is faced with the decision of removing subsidy yeah because many of so many of these governments have already done that right and that's why you see uh, in the u.s a, a, a liter um a, a, sorry um yeah of, of petrol sells for over three dollars Look at Saudi Arabia. Check every other every other place in the world. Even in, in, while everybody was suffering from gas problems in the last few months, Nigeria had more than enough to even cushion the effects. While people were queuing for fuel in China, in the USA, in Russia, in the UK, Nigeria didn't have this kind of problems because the government had its own plans. And, and, and like you said, see, the PIA is going to bring, of course. Um, short-term um, 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 problems in terms of um, hardship or in terms of maybe people grappling to survive economically. But on the long term, that is the best thing that can happen to Nigeria because we know that, see, if subsidy is out, then the government has enough money to do all the things that it needs to do. Like you said, you have defi um, um, budget deficit. You, 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 we are spending money on things we shouldn't spend money on. But when we have money, the trillions that we spend on subsidy, if government has, has that uh, 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 you know, uh, available to them, then they can go ahead, do the rails, do the roads, make sure that the, the, um, 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 out of school children get back into school, you know, continue the school feeding programs and mm. do all, everything uh, that you need let, to do. Let, let's wrap up now. Let me get your, uh, your final thought. Your final, so then my, I will go my, to Lagos. My, my final thought is that the government must be able to distinguish between propaganda and reality. I have served in government before. I know what the statistics are all about. I'm also a farmer. If the government do not face reality and deal with issues on the basis of the facts available to them, they will keep on generating statistics that are not true and they can never be true. The bark of beans today is 40 something thousand. The bark of rice is 40,000. How do you defend this? How do you explain this? So it's, government is no longer about propaganda. Nigeria have, have grown period of propaganda. Reality is what the country needs right now. People must tell their citizens the bare truth, no matter how painful it is. But you can't keep on painting pictures that do not exist anywhere. You cannot keep on saying we have alleviated poverty that you cannot cite it anywhere. 
no matter how you try to propagate this, it cannot work. It's not there. I've served in government. I know what it is. So there's difference between propaganda statistics being generated for whatever political reasons and the reality that is on ground, on the street, that is visible, that is touchable. My right. point is that government must face reality and must tell Nigerians the bare truth. We, we, we're gonna, we need to close in another few seconds. Uh, Mr. Uh, Muda Yusuf, give us your closing thoughts just in a few seconds. Well, I think the government needs to deal with issue of inflation because the worst thing that can happen to the citizens is the erosion of the purchasing power. Even though we talk about inflation has been at 15.6%, if you look at the basket of goods that the average person consumes, you'll be talking of inflation of over 50%. Because just as the colleague in the studio said, some prices have doubled in the last one year, price of things that the common people consume. So that is why there is so much anger, and that is why so many people are on edge. And that is why it has become very difficult to push through some of these reforms. So we need to address the issue of inflation, especially the impact of inflation on poverty, and we also need to address the issue of the foreign exchange environment to be able to attract a lot more investment because we need investment to grow right. the economy. Some of these policies are impeding right. investment. They are impeding job creation. Okay. So those are the things I... Uh, um, I Mr. Bishuga, you have 30 seconds. Your final thought. Yeah. Um, so I agree that government has to tackle inflation and um, the foreign exchange issues. But uh, like I said earlier, um, inflation is global, right? So if you, we can leave this studio and call people anywhere in the world and they'll tell you that prices have almost doubled or tripled. We, we also watch videos online and see how people from other countries complain. But the truth is, yes, government has to tackle inflation. Government has to tackle uh, foreign exchange problems so that at least more Nigerians can benefit right. economically from... from I must, I must sincerely thank you. Uh, it's a difficult situation, not for only government, <laughs> but for the average Nigerian Absolutely. people. Absolutely. And as a nation, we're faced with some of these decisions. And we will uh, sail through and we will overcome. That's one thing I believe if we take the right decision. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming tonight. Thank Mr. Muda Yusuf, thank you so much indeed. Elijah Shehuga, it's thank good you. to see you. Thank, thank you so much you. for coming. And Mr. Sean Bisuga, I appreciate you coming tonight on the program. That's our show for today. It's Friday, and no matter what you're doing and no matter what you plan, do find time to enjoy yourself and uh, stay informed right here on Channel's television until we come back uh, on Sunday Politics. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I'm Sean Kimbale. Bye-bye.